we had the privilege yesterday of riding with our next speaker home. I'm excited about this one. From the Redmond Mind. And if you didn't already love her, which I already love her, I just loved her so much more. She was talking about why she attends conferences and how excited she gets when a speaker says something that makes her say, what? Right. What? Because it's new information and it's so exciting and it means that this adventure does not stop. We've got more to learn in this journey and I'm excited today because I know that Kim Howerton is going to have many what moments for me and for you that I'm really super she excited about. She actually said something to us. We interviewed her in Omaha last year and going back to Dr. Lenski, she helped us with a big stress management last year when we were talking to her and she talked about sometimes we get diet fatigue. I was like, that is and exactly how I feel about the it. The best way to break a stall is to not diet. I was like, that's and unthinkable. Like, I've been doing it since I'm four. That was a what moment, yeah, right? It was a what moment. And you recently experienced that, right? Because I, I reminded Rachel, I'm like, you just went six months without. Gaining a pound or losing by just but the not same. worrying about it. It was it was like a breakthrough. I, I, I'm used to whiplash, right? right? So it was so exciting. Well, let me tell you about this hot lady coming up today. Kim Howerton had been a life coach for a decade when she went keto. She soon realized that she herself was stuck in the very same kind of self defeating belief loop she'd seen so many clients through. Unaware of how good she could feel, she spent decades in a body in ever-declining health, making the best of what she thought was an unfixable body. Once she realized how amazing she could feel when she stopped poisoning herself and allowing her health to improve, she realized there could be no better service to the world but helping others clear away their own health roadblocks. In addition to working with clients, she can be found spending her days and nights running the podcast, Keto Life Support, blogging, and theketonist.com, and making keto recipes for her cookbooks, meal plans. Which are really good, by the way. They're amazing. And it is amazing to get to introduce Kim Howarden. Thank you. Thank you. I'm having, like, flashbacks to high school. I, I didn't learn my lines. I don't know what's going on in the play. All right. Hi, I am Kim Howerton. It is really exciting to be here with you. I'm not used to using a clicker, so we're gonna, gonna go with that. So, hold on a second, I'm waiting for some slides to come up. How's everybody doing? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's been great so far. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Um, so I'm Kim Howerton, I am a coach, I'm a keto coach. I run a podcast, as they said, Keto Life Support. And today I'm going to talk to you about how to stop the struggle, why people fail at long-term weight loss success, and how to be successful. So that's me on a sofa, in case you wanted another view. Yeah, and I, you can see I do have a lower body because um, we've been doing so much remotely, so these pants are new. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, I do want to disclose that I do sell books and coaching and courses about health and weight loss. And um, my focus of my practice at this point is on stalls and people who have difficulty losing weight. Um, I also have another disclosure that I didn't put on the slide, but I can tell you about it. <clears throat> so my first job was as a standardized test prep teacher. I taught people how to take the SAT for a short period of time in college, I was actually recruited to do so because, strangely, I am really good at standardized tests. And so I went, that, it gets worse, don't worry, that wasn't a real brag. Um, so I went and I was, they were like, we would love to have you teach because your score was really great. It's like, great. So I got up in front of the class of high school students looking to take the SAT, looking for knowledge about how to improve their SAT score. And I said, okay. So you're going to read the question. Then there will be five choices. One of those answers will appear to be right to you. And you'll pick that one. And nobody's scores got any better. B 
because I was just naturally skilled at that particular skill. By the way, totally useless in adulthood. <laughs> SAT scores, don't, they, they lie. They tell you these things matter. They don't really matter. But I ended up quitting that job because I wasn't helping anybody. Because the thing that I was just good at by happenstance, by luck, I didn't learn how to fix it. And so the thing I did have to learn how to fix was my body. I had struggled with my weight pretty much my entire life. And I thought it wasn't fixable. I tried diets, I tried weight loss, I, I sometimes succeeded for a brief time, and I just couldn't get where I wanted to go. So a couple years, well, more than a couple, several years ago, I found a podcast and heard the word keto for the first time. And from there, I was able to drop over 100 pounds and learn a lot about the process of weight loss because I did the thing that we all do and it seemed so easy and then it got really hard and I thought, I must be broken. I went back to those mindsets about this being too hard. And so today, what we're going to talk about is weight loss as an outcome. I wanted to bring this up specifically because I think we all in this room know it's not just about weight loss, right? I think you come for the weight loss, you stay for the health, right? But some of us really still do want weight loss, and it is part of our overall health picture. So I'm going to talk specifically about weight loss today. And I'm going to use the term weight loss, or I'm going to try to, rather than fat loss. Although I think fat loss is actually more important than just weight loss, most of the studies I'm talking about specifically focus on weight loss, so I'm just trying to be consistent. I'm also going to be talking primarily about mindset and habits, rather than the physical aspects. A lot of amazing people are here at this conference this weekend, and they're going to talk about all sorts of things, but I figured the physical stuff might be covered more, so let's talk about the mental stuff, because as a coach, that's what I focus on a little bit more. So we have this assumption, right? We have this assumption that we make a plan, we decide to lose the weight, we climb the weight loss staircase, we get to the top, we hit the target, and we're done. That's, that's what we think should happen, right? But really, the staircase is a little more treacherous. People fall through it, they fall off it, and sometimes they just leap from the top. <laughs> and uh, so I want to bring this up that, that there is this thing that happens, especially on keto, right? There's this lock and key fit. I had that with standardized testing. I would have paid some serious money to have it with my body weight instead, by the way. But just like there's just this thing. You do the thing, and the thing works. And you're like, oh, magic, right? And we know those people. We know those people. They went keto. They dropped the carbs. I mean, some of these people are just like, I stopped drinking soda and lost 100 pounds. And you're like, awesome. Um, but uh, some of these people in the keto community, it is awesome. I'm happy for them. I am not them. And so what I want to point out is there is something called survivorship bias, right? We don't hear from the people that quit. We hear from the people that succeed. And so we get this idea that it's supposed to be easy, that the people that are talking have the important things to say. Sometimes the people with the most important things to say don't feel like they should talk. And so I think it's very important to talk about failure and the feeling of failure. So it's, it's not really hard to discern why we think this weight loss thing should be easy. And you have to kind of look a little closer at some of the promises were made to see why it's not true. We watch reality TV. I put reality in quotes. We watch this show where they lose amazing amounts of weight uh, it's called The Biggest Loser. It's a competition about weight loss, which I don't really, but I watched it, and I, I used to think it was real-ish. Yeah, I knew, it was a little bit. You know, I knew they picked scenes, and no, but we were told, like, this weight loss is possible in a week if you just, like, want it enough and you just dedicate yourself to it, right? The reality is, what they told you was a week was two or three. 
that all their food was supplied, that they were locked in a house where they weren't allowed to leave and access any other food. They had no real interaction, no responsibilities, no job other than losing weight. They exercised for over eight hours a day, often to the point of vomiting. So, like, just let's throw some bulimia in there, right? Like, it's, it's, a, it's a lot going on. Their focus was on dropping scale weight, not, um, not on body fat. And that can often be to the detriment of your long-term success. Let's talk about the news. So this is, a, this is the, on the stands right now, Women's World magazine. And this is Lisa. Lisa is actually my client. So I know a lot about Lisa, and she gave me permission to talk about her. And it's actually true what it says here, that Lisa Bronstein lost 151 pounds and watched her blood sugar drop 170 points. Lisa actually went keto because she is type 2 diabetic and wanted to fix that. But notice it says drop 16 pounds in 10 days. So Lisa is amazing. Lisa is much more amazing than the story would, would let you know. But Lisa did lose 151 pounds. She lost it over four years. When I did the math, that averages to one pound every 10 days, not 16. Now, that's an amazing rate of loss. That is so good and should be celebrated. But that will never make a magazine cover. Can you imagine if the magazines said that? Lose one pound in the next 10 days. Amaze your friends, right? That doesn't happen. We see a lot of fake weight loss ads. Well, they're real ads. They would actually like your money. But they're fake photos and fake promises. This is Gabor Sedebe, who's an amazing actress. This is not a real photo situation, though. She did have weight loss surgery, and she did lose a considerable amount of weight. But you can see an after of a considerable amount of weight is not what we're often sold we might look like. Then I'm going to say it. Weight loss coaches, hello, <laughs> we are at fault. We have to do better at making legitimate and like realistic promises. Because when you run ads that tell people they can lose a gazillion pounds by Monday, look, this client did it, and you're like, yeah, the first week when they dropped a bunch of water weight, let's not set that expectation, because who's done the math, right? I have Excel spreadsheets to prove it. If I lose five pounds the first week, the second week I'll be at 10. In one month, I will be a size two, right? We've all done that progression. I've never had that progression happen. We've been set up. And I'm going to be honest, we, we are we, right? We set ourselves up. It is a cycle. We want to believe it. Can anyone guess what the number one question I get when I tell people that I've lost over 100 pounds is? How long did it take you? And I always think that is the thought in your head that will mean that you won't do it. When people ask me, how long did it take you, I would actually place money that they will fail. Everyone kind of asks it. I'm not saying you can't overcome that mindset. But as long as you cling to that mindset, you will fail. There's going to be someone in here who's like, I didn't fail. Most people will fail. Well, I'll put it that way. We prize speed, effortlessness, and extreme, right? Like extreme weight loss, extreme makeover. Remember that show? That show was scary. <laughs> Doubt me, I just found this magazine like two days ago. Lazy keto, lazy whatever, like take your pick of whatever. I mean, it's just an interpretation. It's not actually the title that gets me. 100 plus ways to get healthy without changing your life. Isn't that the point to change your life? I mean, people are like, I would love everything I ever wanted as long as I don't have to do anything. Can we make that happen? No. We're hope addicts. Some of us would rather fail and be hopeful than be realistic about what is possible for us. Because hope feels so good. You know, it's been many, many years since I had a Sunday where I dreamed about my Monday diet. But do you know that thing where, like, Sunday night, you're like, Monday, 
Monday is going to be the day that I start my new life. And like Monday afternoon, you're like, not this Monday, right? <laughs> but that、oh, Sunday night feeling is really intoxicating. You're like, I'm going to do this. It's going to be awesome. I'm pumped until breakfast. And then no, that was not as fun as I thought it would be. So I'm sorry that I'm shattering the fantasy for you guys.、Uh, I come by my nickname honestly, Captain Killjoy. <laughs> I'm here to destroy your dreams. But the reality is, I think that by being real, realistic, human, right, we have a chance. We have a chance that we don't have in fantasy land. We don't live there. We'll never live there. Fantasy is somewhere else. So I wanted to share a little more. There's this study by、uh, Gary Foster et al., and it's called I call it the Dreamweight Study. They looked at 60 women, average weight of 218 pounds, variety of heights, but giving you averages here, or else we'll be here all day. And they did a 48-week intervention. So these people were entering into a diet program, and they asked them to fill out a questionnaire. What would be their dream weight, their happy weight, their acceptable weight, and their disappointed weight? By the way, what's funny when I told my boyfriend about this study, he was like, "So the disappointed weight would be they gain weight?" And I was like, "Oh no, 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 they still lost weight." These were the definitions. So you would be disappointed if you were a weight that is less than your current weight, but one you could not view as successful in any way. You would be disappointed if this was your outcome. Acceptable. Be acceptable was a weight that you would not be particularly happy with, but you would accept. You're not giving it back, right? As it is less than your current weight. Happy weight, not as ideal as the dream weight, but would feel pretty good about achieving it. And the dream weight, the weight that you would choose if you could weigh whatever you wanted, like no basis in reality, tall, short, bones, no bones, right? Whatever you could weigh. And, and then they they asked them these, and they came up with these numbers. So,、uh, the disappointed weight—if they over those 48 weeks lost 38 pounds, a、uh, 17% body weight loss—they would feel disappointed. Anything less, that or less. Acceptable, about 55 pounds, 25% of their body weight. Happy was 31%, about 68 pounds. By the way, they also asked them their target weight, like what they plan to lose in the program. This happy was the closest. It was actually 70 pounds. It was a little bit more. And the dream weight was a loss of 84 pounds,、uh, 39%. So that, if, I, if I'm doing the math right, I think that was going from like 218 to like 134 in this program. Actual. They, they averaged 35 pounds, which is amazing. So good. They were below disappointed. Below, right? Now I do have a little bit of good news. They asked them afterwards, like, "Are you disappointed?" And they were like, "I don't know that I can use the word disappointed. It might be acceptable, but they weren't happy." We overestimate what we can do in the short term. And underestimate what we can do in the long term, and I would say that because we overestimate what we can do in the short term is why we don't do as well in the long term. So a little reality check: virtual reality, media, weight loss stories, not always real. And then it's not just about the losing of the weight; it's about the keeping of the weight off the body, right? Because I think we can all kind of agree that if you just got down there and like bounced back up like you were on a bungee cord, it's not really long-term success. And this slide is intentionally vague, by the way, because it's picturing weight loss in the real world. And I will tell you, studies about real—wow, that is a tongue twister. Real world weight loss. Really suck. They're not very good, not very accurate. Because I think people, free living people,、uh, don't give very good statistics about success.、It、tends to be also the unsuccessful people don't tell you things. But best case scenario, what we can see is at about the two-year mark. The best case scenario seems to be that about 20% of people will have kept a good portion of weight off that they've lost. 
Some stats say 5%. Those seem a little bit iffy. They're actually from a limited number of studies. But the other thing to know is that of the people that regain the weight, the pink guys, some of, the, some of them do keep a good portion of it off. But the majority of people who regain the weight don't just regain the weight they lost. They bring some extra friends, and they regain more. So that if you took like, the average of all these people together, the group would weigh more than when they started, even including the people that maintain their loss. Yeah, I wasn't kidding about the Captain Killjoy part, in case anyone was confused. <laughs> but don't get defeated. Stay with me. It gets better. We're going to get hopeful in a minute. Because there are weight loss success stories. There are weight... Okay, there raise your hand, yell it out, clap it up. Who feels like they've achieved some level of success on their journey thus far? Right? Right? Because you guys are dedicated. You're here. You're putting in the work. And there's also something called the National Weight Control Registry. This is a registry of over 10,000 people. And to get into this registry, you have to have lost at least 30 pounds and maintained it for at least a year. So these people are success stories. And when you average this group, they've lost an average of 66 pounds. Their average BMI went from 36 to 24. By the way, I know BMI, not a perfect measure, but with groups of people, you can track it. And the average maintenance is actually over five years. And 55% of them say they have ongoing weight loss desires. So they lost some weight. They may want to lose some more weight, but they're doing well with where they've gotten to so far. And then they study these people. They run studies on what makes people successful. And this is Spreckley et al. did a systematic review. So there are individual studies about different components of, of weight loss. And then Spreckley and her group took those studies and reviewed them and came up with some important notes for us that we'll talk about today. So let's talk first about behaviors that impair weight loss management. So these are the not-to-dos. Don't worry, I'm going to end on a high note. Okay, we're going to get to the good stuff at the end. The first one was lack of preparation and scheduling. So if you don't prepare, you have less of a chance of succeeding. Hopefully not surprising. But a lot of us, myself included, kind of fly by the seat of our pants, people. I prefer to be spontaneous, mostly because I'm always running late and I don't like to plan things, right? It's, it's character flaw. I'm, I'm working on it. But um, it doesn't have to look like little prepared packaged box meals all in your fridge with like days of the week on them. It's the appropriate level of preparation for you. Might just mean, you know, having the right stuff in your fridge. So, the other thing that was noted is they did not schedule things, especially things related to their health. Uh, not, not good is not monitoring. So you can monitor lots of things, but they weren't monitoring weight, they weren't monitoring measurements, they weren't monitoring health markers. Not monitoring things tended to lead to regain. People who regained the weight tended to see weight loss as a finish line. I did it. I got there. I won. Though this is, remember the swan dive off the top? That's, that's these people, right? Because they often did not maintain that. Their motivations tended to be more metrics-based. What are metrics? Like numbers-based, right? So it was a dress size, a weight, right? A metric-based goal tended to actually have less success. Their life was full of people that I would call doubters, criticizers, and skeptics. They allowed people into their hearts, right? Into their space, into their circle, who criticized them, who told them they couldn't do it, who just kind of looked at them funny a lot, right? Um, these people being included in your heart can really bring you down. They spent a lot of time feeling deprived. They reported very high on feeling deprived. And I just like the picture of the dog, so we had to go with that. <laughs> they felt at the mercy of social pressure. So, you know, it's not that you can always avoid social pressure, but they felt out of control about it. Whether it was lunch with friends and they didn't feel that, like, they could order their own thing, or grandma's cookies. 
and they felt like they couldn't say no. They did not have healthy coping skills and treated eating as their main coping skill. I know that one, right? Before this keto experience, like literally my only life skill was eating. Sad, eat. Happy, eat. Bored, eat. It was always available. And it was very useful when I was a depressed nine-year-old. You know, I mean, I just want to stop for a second and say for some of us, we have struggled with more than our weight. And I did. I had massive depression by the time when I was in elementary school. And for a while, eating helped. It's helpful for some things. When you lack any skills of emotional self-regulation when you're a little kid, eating is the easiest way to do it. Unfortunately, my coping mechanism became a bigger detriment at some point than useful. The, the balance tipped, and then I had to address that as well. But along the way, while I was leaning on food as my coping skill, as my friend, um, I, I let it be everything, and I didn't develop the healthy coping skills that apparently I had no idea. Some people do develop <laughs> along the way, right? Friends, <laughs> no, talking to people. Exercise, I mean, that, as a coping skill, that seemed really nuts to me. <laughs> but um, emotional, man emotional eating, not really great problem solving. They tended to have a fixed mindset. So fixed, not like fixed, opposite of broken, <laughs> fixed like the opposite of flexible. They saw things rigidly, right? Black and white, good, bad. Like I had one cookie, the day is ruined. Right? Not, I had a cookie. All right, whatever. Right. Okay, I'm going to stop for a second and really go into this one because it's huge with my clients, so be a little disproportionate amount of time on this. But not understanding scale fluctuations was brought up as a huge source of people ending up giving up on their weight loss efforts. So I'm going to give you a little study here. Let's take Sarah. For example, Sarah weighed herself. She started her diet on a Friday. By the way, I'm using the word diet to mean like a, a, a period of weight loss approach, right? And we all know we all have a diet. It's just what we eat. But when I use diet here, I'm going to talk about a, a concentrated time there. Someone's trying to lose weight. She starts her diet on Friday, weighs 200 pounds. Next Friday, weighs 200 pounds again. Following Friday, 200 pounds. Last Friday, 200 pounds. Sarah is not okay. Sarah is very frustrated. So Sarah does something I call the pile-up. When we have poor coping skills, we they tend to come in groups, right? So she's going to add some emotional eating to the situation and throw in a little fixed mindset. I am broken. I can't lose weight. I've been trying so hard. So that's like the recipe for failure stew, right? Has anyone experienced something like this feeling in them? You know, maybe. I did a lot. But what if Sarah actually could see what her weight was doing every day? She'd see that, yeah, it happened to be up on those Fridays, but in between, it was down. It was up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. This is what weight does. And if she actually averaged out all of those 22 days, she would have seen she was averaging a loss of about a pound a week. It just was really bad luck that she happened to weigh on the days that her weight was up. Maybe she always went out to a certain restaurant on Thursdays and they used a lot of salt and just water weight fluctuations happen. There can be a variety of reasons. Maybe she did her hardest workouts on Thursdays. That can maintain pe make people maintain a little more water. So, there could have been a number of reasons, but because she only looked at little snapshots and she made the weight mean something. So I'm not saying you have to like weigh yourself every single day. It's a method to manage this. But what you can't do is believe incomplete data. Because the scale will, the weight will fluctuate. There is a 2% variance just from being a human. Just goes up and down. 
So I'm going to pause for a second. This isn't actually on the list of why people fail, but I felt like it was, a, I, was I got my opportunity, I'm going to take it, because it's an important point. We also see this, which is you weigh yourself once a week, and this person is like, by the end of that three-week period, is like, I'm doing so awesome, this is going somewhere. And then that was actually the week, or the three weeks. And then this is what it actually is going on. If you happen to weigh a day earlier or a day later, you would have decided that you either lost three pounds, gained three pounds, or stayed the same weight. You can't look at too little of a data set and make it mean something. You have to wait for more time to go by. So this is what ends up happening. Right? This is a client of mine, Julie, she's awesome. She gave me permission to use this. She spent a whole week going up and down, five, I'm sorry, a whole year going up and down these five pounds. This is how you fool yourself into thinking something is happening and suddenly, well, I don't know, I have this experience, I'm like, how am I 45? How did that happen, right? I mean, like, time just goes by and it's the same. You're like, how have I been doing this keto thing for three years? And I've weighed the same thing for a really long time. I've, it makes you feel like you don't know what you're doing. But the reality is if we don't put our eggs in the basket of thinking something's happening with shoddy data and we wait to see true change, then we'll get stuck. But you can turn the tide. You have to watch the trends. So I just wanted to really bring it home about the weight thing, that you can fool yourself in multiple directions. And I see this just take people at, like, down, like out at the knees, just gone um, in both directions. They waste years or they give up all the time. And so I just want to say, like, you are not based, like your worth is not based on what you weigh, but it is an important data point if you're trying to lose weight. It's a metric. So, okay, we're getting to the good part now. How to win at losing. I like to be a loser. <laughs> All right? I once really embarrassed, oh, it's a long story. Anyway, I'll go to later, but. Um, so what do these people do? These people here, they are successful losers. What do they do? They self-monitor whether that's their weight, their measurements, their health metrics. They use metrics, numbers, figures, to keep track of their progress. And this is after they've reached maybe their goal weight even. They do action tracking, either tracking their macros, journaling, portion control, meal timing, calorie tracking. It doesn't matter which one it is, they all are successful, but they're staying connected to the fact that they have to change their actions and take different actions on a daily basis. They create healthy boundaries and a sense of self-worth. I mean, that sounds amazing. I like that one. How do they do that? They meal plan, they exercise. Doesn't, isn't that funny? We think like healthy boundaries. It's like, I can't do that. That sounds like a grown-up person does that. Does anyone else ever thought, like, who's the grown-up? I don't know. It's, I think it might be me, but that's crazy. Um, but you do like meal planning. And that could look like anything, as I was saying earlier. Like, do you have meat in the fridge can be meal planning, right? It doesn't have to look like any one thing, but it has to happen in the way that works for you. Um, they exercise. They plan it. They time it. And it can look like a variety of exercise, right? The most common exercise was walking that people did, but they did it consistently. People who maintained their weight did. They're intrinsically motivated. So rather than being motivated by a, a metric, like a scale weight, a dress size, something external, they're motivated not by a thing, but what that thing gets them. So here we've got like, you know, grandpa pushing his granddaughter on the bike, teaching her to ride a bike. If, if you can't walk because your joints can't take it, you can't do this, right? So this intrinsic motivation, it's not that I want to weigh a certain weight, it's that I want to do certain things. What will that weight get you? Because the weight in and of itself doesn't get you much, but what you can do 
When you change your life, when you change your body, that gets you something. They went into holidays or social events with a plan. Now, you might be surprised, some of you here, to know that plan sometimes meant they would eat the things at the holiday table, but they knew going in what they would do. They knew, okay, there's going to be this, there's going to be that. I might have that because it means something to me. I won't have that because it's not very good and Aunt Sally can't cook. But um, if they were going to a restaurant, they looked at the menu ahead of time. They sometimes brought food with them to places because they knew that that was safer for them. So again, it doesn't have to be, it's not all the same. We're not all the same, just like Dr. Lencia said. We all have different ways that we proceed, but you have to know what works for you and find a way to stick to it. They had a problem-solving orientation. To think your life won't have adversity is a fantasy, right? Every life has some level of adversity. And every, if, if we have food as any level of a coping skill, it's going to be real hard to not go there in that time that is challenging. When things are going well, it's a lot easier. Unfortunately, you can't schedule the bad things. It's like, mm, the breakdown, we'll do that in January, right? It's not the way the world goes. It's going to come upon you unexpectedly. And so you have to, in the good times, you have to be laying the skills, right? Figuring out what works for you, having a problem-solving mentality, and knowing how to navigate your trigger foods. Because your trigger foods are not your trigger foods are not your trigger foods. Oh, and also creating new coping skills, right? Because we've, we've determined, hopefully, that eating is not a good coping skill. So you have to find some replacements, some people to talk to. Might be therapy, might be a friend, going out in nature if you like that sort of thing, funny movies, things that help you that aren't about food. Oops. Stress management. So finding stress management. Stress is the thing that takes most people down. Um, for a lot of people, they listed exercise as being a good stress management technique. Almost 300 pound me would have said they were insane because exercise was like the most stressful thing I could think to do. I had such, I actually once bought a URL called Gung No because I was like the opposite of excited to do anything physical, right? And uh, I don't even know who I am anymore. Like I look forward to going to the gym and I, I am having an identity crisis. I don't, I don't know, but I, it's good. I like it. But it doesn't have to look like anyone else's stress management. What brings you comfort, what makes you feel good, that doesn't also set you back, right? It has to be a net positive. They, uh, successful losers, um, they had a continuous goal setting. So rather than like crossing the finish line, oops, I'm losing an ear thing, hold on. Rather than crossing the finish line, they looked at it like surfing. You get up on the board. I don't surf, but I think this is what they do. They get up on the board, and if you immediately fall off the board, you gotta get back on the board, and you gotta get, right? Because surfing is not about getting on the board. It's about staying on the board, as far as I know. If I'm wrong, please correct me. But to, to be a good surfer, you need to be on the board, not under the board. So once you get somewhere, you have to set a new goal. You have to set a new goal. You have to set a new goal. And that goal might just be maintenance, 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 right? Because for the longest time, you were like, another five pounds. I want another five pounds. Let me get another five pounds. And like, you get there. You're like, I don't know what to do. I've never been here before. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Another goal. Stay there. And then expand the goals. I want to run a 5K. I'm not at that goal yet, but you know, whatever it is, right? Or I want to take a yoga class, or I want to play with puppies. I don't know what it is, but set new goals, set more goals, things that are going to make you connected to long-term health. They had social support, whether that was just friends who would say, like, "Atta girl, you're doing really good, or people that would do things with them, go to a class, ate the same way they did, right? A lot of us have this, right? Okay, is anyone not in like some sort of Facebook group or follow somebody on Instagram that inspires them? I think in this, in this day and age, right, like 
you're, you're here, so I've answered the question, right? They're, look to your left, look to your right. <laughs> They're here. We have social support, we have these people. Even if the people in your immediate life aren't those people, because sometimes they aren't, it's okay. Add these people to your life. You can just add good so that you don't have to rely on the less good, right? I'm not saying anybody has to like cut out the doubters, but maybe don't talk to them about your desired weight loss because you know what they're going to say. Maybe you talk to them about golf, their life, right? Don't expect support from people that don't readily give it. It's a sad fact, but you can protect yourself from people who have not done their work by doing yours. Structured support. So things like coaching, that was listed. I'm not being totally, <laughs> I don't know, it might be my profession, but you know, getting some coaching has been helpful. And having a flexible mindset as opposed to the fixed mindset. So being able to think something went wrong, it's okay, I can fix it. This didn't go according to plan, that's all right, I'll roll with it. Starting to get out of black and white thinking. Thinking like a problem solver. And I'm going to just bring up the Verta to your results. You guys all know, of course, Verta. We've talked about the amazing Sarah Hallberg. But Verta is an intervention for people with type 2 diabetes. And over in their two-year results, what did they find? That the weight was down 12% in their cohort. Of 74% of the people that started that program were still with it and there was a 29% reduction in metabolic syndrome. Why am I bringing this up? Well, it's actually a great demonstration of the skills. So there's a little note under the weight down. So a weight loss, compared to average weight loss programs, which average about 6% weight loss in the same time period, Verta was twice that much. And if you compare it to like just a random group of people in the population, they would be up 5%. So compared to doing nothing, it was a lot better. But I want to point out that Verta is not a weight loss program. It's a health program. They're helping people turn around their diabetes, their type 2 diabetes. That's intrinsic motivation. They did twice as well as the people that are focused on the metric, on the weight loss. So by focusing on what does it get me, where am I trying to fix in my life? What am I trying to be able to accomplish? You can get farther than if you just focus on the number. It was a structured program. There was coaching. They were tracking and monitoring. They had a little app. There was stress management. They had them plan for events. There was meal planning in that app. And so you can see that it's happening in our community, that we're taking these skills. You know, I mean, the people that started Verta, they're not dumb. They know the successful skills. And they created a program that included them. And I, I just wanted to point this out to say um, these, these pieces, they all go together, and you can see how you can take one skill and build on it and add another skill and build on it and just go towards the habits that take you towards more success. So time after time. So the Great news is the longer people maintained, the longer they maintained. So if they could get to a year, they were more likely to get to two. They got to two, they were more likely to get to three. Three years actually predicted five, and then five to 10. So it just exponentially grew because the skills that got you the weight loss, that you developed over the weight loss, you were practicing them as you were losing the weight. You cemented them in the maintenance, in the successful maintenance you were having. And by the way, maintenance doesn't mean you reach like your end goal. Remember, at the beginning, 55% still wanted to lose more weight. But where you are, if you're not gaining or losing weight, you are maintaining, right? So sticking with it and reinforcing those behaviors. I'm sorry if I make anyone feel drunk that I keep dancing around. It's just how I do. Identity was a huge piece. They felt like a new person. They talked about this. They used the word reinvention. They used that word frequently. They reinvented their life. They reinvented their identity, who they were. They went from a person that was unhealthy to a person that prized health. 
They went from a person that thought exercise sounded like the worst torture to someone that, I went to the hotel gym. I mean, some of you are like, why is she so shocked? I was shocked to be in a hotel gym. I have never gone to. I'm, hotel felt like, you know, a vacation. What do you got to do? Room service is what you get at a hotel, right? Not the gym, but I went and I was like, I don't know who I am anymore. Reinvent your identity. Think about who you want to be. You get to decide. Because growing up, up till now, I just think we're kind of like a cobbled together coping mechanism sometimes, right? Like things happen, we figure out how to make it work. We're like wrapping ourselves with duct tape just to get through the year. But weight loss, turning your health around, it is an opportunity to like put a stake in the ground and say, this is who I am becoming. And, and you get to do that, you get to decide. These are some of the studies I talked about in case you wanted to take note of them. I'll provide this for anybody that wants it. And that is what I had to tell you about today. So thank you so much for joining me. You can find me at kimhowerton.com. And just so you know, a, a lot of these skills I talked about, um, they require habit formation. And it just so happens that last year at Keto Salt Lake, I talked about habit formation. So if you want to watch that video, if you haven't, put them together, and you'll be on your way. So thank you, guys.